All right, class, we're in uh, section 11 here. All right, and yeah, we're, the narrator has asked a simple question. Why should you learn the Tegra story, and why should you learn the Libra story? And there's kind of an argument here, and he, uh, he again, he tells the narrator that you become a passive listener because uh, he doesn't give him a good example of, of why he wants to learn the Libra story and why he wants to learn the Tegra story. So I think one thing of note is he asked, why would you want to learn, stop the Tegra story? And this is a good, a good section. And, he, and notice they keep, uh, they keep uh, metaphorically comparing what we're doing uh, with civilization as a Tegra culture to what Hitler did. And you got to understand the theme is trying to be getting across here is if you look at uh, if you look at us from humans, from everything else in the world's point of view, we are like the Nazis. We are like Hitler. We are just systematically committing genocide. So he refers to the Taker civilization as the Thousand Year Reich, the Thousand Year Rule. Um, so he t he asks him again, why is this story so learned? Why why did the kids you know? Uh, trying to do in the 60s and 70s. They were trying to stop the takers. They were trying to live a new way, find a better way to live. So what is this story all about? And he says, uh, I don't know. And he says, what do you think is about hunting and gathering? I don't know. You know I don't know. I don't know. Um, and he asked him this, how did man become man? How did humans become humans? All right. And he says, uh, did you, you did, uh, you know, uh, what exactly did they do? You know, and he starts trying to look for a kind of event, you know, uh, and basically he's, he says, you know, well, it's a little bit more than just, you know, Cain and Abel and, and uh, Adam and Eve. It's more than just, you know, starting to grow things. You know, what, 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 what do we do? What do we do? And basically uh, it's, it's again, it's all these ideas that we've come across together. We, you know, we, we've taken ourselves out of competition with nature, you know, the law of life, competition, you know, don't kill your competition, don't steal their food, don't deny them access to food. Uh, we force these things on everybody else. We've said, this is the one right way to live. And we've passed this story of civilization down and down and down. And then you ask them, you know, wh why do you think it is that every time we come in contact with levers like the Plains Indians or Aborigines or tribal Africans or, you know, the Scottish or the Sami people of Finland, you know, why is it that they don't want to, to convert? You know, if it's such a great way of life, why do they always resist it? We talked about this in the last lecture. And, um, you know, he asked him to think about what the revolution was against, you know, what exactly was it doing? Right, so he describes he describes these things as you know as technological events and revolutions and uh, but one of the things that we we've, we've done is we've taken ourselves out of evolution. We don't actually compete with animals anymore. Um, so basically, what we've done is we take ourselves out of competition with animals and we've started committing you know, mass murder. And then every time we come across levers, we say, oh, look at them. You know, look at the way they live. You know, uh, and, 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 and we call them, you know, lazy and stuff like that because they don't come over to a 12-hour work day. Then he starts asking uh, on page 218, which is around section four, you know, why was this necessary? And what is it that we've told ourselves is behind this? And what he says is we've told ourselves that our mind is meaningless. You know, that we're on this endless, you know, treadmill of just trying to survive. And it's so hard for leavers and native people. They're always hungry and something's always trying to eat them. And again, we've already discovered in this class and it's not true, you know, right? Um, but he points out, of course, that, you know, with all the grand things of civilization, we still have poverty. We still have despair. We still have slums. Uh, because we believe in our revolution, that it's better than living in nature. But yet again, that's why he brings up the idea that levers always have to be converted over force, because it's a great way to live for them, you know. 
Uh, you don't have, you know, a work day. You know, you don't kill yourself until you retire and then, then die in a nursing home. You know, you're always with family. You're free. You know, you get to be a part of nature and things that you value. Uh, and so it talks about the idea of fear. We've convinced ourselves that it's hard to live as hunter-gatherers that live a very grim life. And then he points out that we are the most adapted species on this planet. We survive in every single part of this planet, and there really you know, are only a handful of species that can do this. We're really well-developed well omnivores. You know, it's really not that... You know, difficult to survive when you're raised in that nature and you have that knowledge that's passed down. But what we've done is we've taken it away. So he considers, you know, so he asked the narrator, what if you were given a box? And if you push the button on that box, you know, you could instantly be back in Lever society, right? Um, and Because he says, you know, you're homeless, right? Imagine you're homeless, but you're given a magic box. And if you push that button, you can go back and you live in Lever society and you have all their knowledge. It's just like you were born into it. Or would you remain homeless? And I've asked the, that question to the class a lot. And I've had a lot of students, you know, say, yeah, they would go back. I had a lot of students say, no, I would rather be, you know, homeless on the street and civilization than there. Uh, because I wouldn't want to give up a thing like a phone and stuff like this. Um, so, you know, that's the choice, you know, live in civilization and face extinction or do something different, or go back to being leavers. <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, they're going back to being leavers isn't going to work. But they did this because it worked for them for hundreds of thousands of years. So this is really interesting. This whole section here, he says, okay, I want you to pretend to try to convert me, a lever, over to being a taker. So let's get started. He says, Okay, narrator, Buana, which is Swahili for a uh, teacher or student, I think, I can't remember. He says, uh, you tell us that the way we live is wretched and shameful and wrong. You tell us not the way the people are used to live, but since you can ride to the stars and the moon and send words across the world at the speed of thought with your phones, why don't you tell us why it's the wrong way to live? And he says, uh, okay, your life is wretched because you leavers live like animals, right? And Ishmael says, I don't understand. We live like everything else does. Does that mean that lions and deer leave shameful lives? And he says, no, because that's just, you know, that's because they're, they're animals. They're not humans. And see, that's the big distinction. We think because we're humans, we're not animals, but we are. You know, we're the same as everything else on this planet. We are mammals. Anyways, so he says, well, okay, well, why is it bad to live this way? And he says, because you have no control over your lives. You have no control over the basic thing like your food supply. And he says, what do you mean we don't have control over it? As a lever, I could go off into the woods and always find something to eat. There's always, the whole world is food. And he says, yeah, but you would have more control if you planted it yourself. And he says, yeah, but Mr. Taker, you know, narrator, why do I have to plant the food myself? It grows in abundance all on its own. Why should I work when it's already provided for me? And he says, well, if you plant it there, you know it's going to be there if you plant it yourself. And he says, well, that's crazy. I always know it's going to be there. What do you think? Somebody's going to steal the world? And then he says, no, no, Ishmael, you know, lever. If you planted it yourself, you could control how much was there and what was there. If you wanted more yams and you didn't have any, you could grow some. You could always have what you wanted. And he says, but that's crazy. Why should I work? Mr. Taker, when things grow in abundance without any effort on my part, why should I do that? And he says, yeah, but what if you run out? And he says, well, I'll just go and get something different if I run out. He said, yeah, but what if you run out, and just like a petulant child, what if you run out and you can't get what you want? You want a yam, but you can't have it. And he says, yeah, but doesn't that happen to you? And he says, yeah, but I can go to the store and get one. And then here Ishmael turns the tables on him and says, yeah, tell me about this store thing, okay? So how many people does it take to do this? Let's see, you gotta you gotta hire somebody, you know, you gotta have a farmer that's got the land, you gotta pay somebody to plant the land, you gotta plant the land yourself. Okay, you gotta have big tractors and stuff, so you gotta have people to make the tractors, 
You got to buy the tractors that got to be sold at a store. You got to bring them here. You got to run them. You got to have people to make the gasoline and the parts for them. Then we're going to use the tractors and harvest everything. Then we got to load those into the trucks. And you got to have people to build the trucks. And the truck drivers have to take it to the processing plants. And you got to have people to breathe to build the factories and people to process it into tin cans and whatever. And then you got to have it driven to the store. And then you got people to build the store. And then you got people to work in the store. All this so you can have a damn yam. When you run out, that sounds crazy. Why would I give up my life of freedom, hunting, fishing, art, poetry, being with my family, being with my loved ones to go to work just so I can have a yam when I don't want one? He says, look, you're missing your point. And he says, if you don't control your own food supply, you live at the mercy of the world. If you don't control your own food supply, you live at the mercy of the gods. The gods decide whether you, whether how you live and whether or not you've got what you want, right? Like, what if you go out hunting one day and you get a deer, but you really wanted, you know, you know, a rabbit, you know? Um, so you don't have any control over it. You don't have any control of getting what you want. And then Ishmael says, well, okay, Mr. Taker, is that why we should set aside a life we love to go work all day in a factory and die of some lung disease because, you know, we don't get to eat rabbit when we want rabbit. You know, instead we have to sell for something else. It's crazy. The world is food. He says, yeah, but there's no guarantee there's going to be food. What if there's a drought or a flood? And he says, yeah, you know, these things wither. They go away. You know, and if it's really, really, really bad, we would wither too. You know, we die. He says, yes, that's the point. If you're a taker, you don't have to live at the mercy of when the gods say you're going to die. You can decide that for yourself. That's what it means to be human, to defy the gods. And Israel, of course, doesn't believe that because, you know, just because you don't starve to death doesn't mean you're not going to get hit by a car you know, or shot by a criminal. So basically the idea here between, you know, the difference between levers and takers is levers trust in the gods and live what the gods give them without disrupting the order, whereas takers want exactly what they want, when they want, want control over it. So we defy all of our gods and our various religions. We do not live in the hands of gods. All right. So hopefully your mind's a little blown at this point because, you know, basically it means if you're living in civilization, you're living in sacrilege and defiance of, you know, the God's fates for you. Anyways, so only when we've taken the world out of our control in our own hands, will we be the gods, will we control everything. And he points this out. One thing that if I asked the class right now, I'd ask if you thought Jesus was more of a lever or a taker, which would you say? And probably most people would probably say lever. I mean, you know, he grows up and he learns to be a carpenter, but once he's an adult and chooses how to live, he moves nomadically from place to place like a lever living off the land and nature. And he gets quite upset in civilization several times. In fact, civilization kills him. But he also says this, have no care for tomorrow. Don't worry whether or not you're going to have something to eat. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, but God takes perfect care of them. Don't you think he'll do the same for you? So right now, you might be wondering, is it possible that one of Jesus' messages was for us to return as nature, to nature to live a pure life like Levers did? Because he lives his life like a lever, moving nomadically, not holding down a job, creating beautiful words and... Uh, lessons and truths, uh, you know, rather than working a nine to fiver. You know, he goes into church a couple of times in the Bible, flips some tables over, gets upset, flogs the merchant people. Um, you know, he bucks society and, uh, and civilization kills him. So, you know, that's a common tale to what happens to leavers. You know, they're usually killed by civilization. All right, that ends section 11.